The Speaking of Cults podcast is presented solely for general informational, educational, and entertainment purposes. The use of information on this podcast or materials linked from it is at the user's own risk. The views, information, or opinions expressed by the host and guests are solely those of the individuals involved and do not constitute medical or other professional advice. Hello, everybody. This is Chris Shelton. I'm John Atak. You probably know that by now. This is about our 700th show together. Um, it's, it is about 30-something by now. It's, it's about 30. Yeah, it's about oh. 30. <laughs> Hi, John. Dude. And we're still talking to each other. Imagine that. I know. Uh, speaking of cults, uh, that is what we do. And uh, boy, we have the best talks. I These are, uh, you, you are absolutely, I mean, obviously, you're my favorite recurring guest on my well, podcast. <laughs> As well as being a wonderful friend. So, um, hey, everybody out there, let's do a show. We're going to talk about some Scientology stuff this time, I think. John, what do you uh, what do you have for us here? This is a little, little the talk. Cult of Greed. The Cult of Greed, which was an homage to Rich Behar's article in Time, The Cult of Greed and Power, I think it was called. Yes. Um, I was asked to give a talk in St. Petersburg back, back when we were still allowed to go there in 2014. Not the one in Florida, the the original one, Leningrad, as it was also known, Petrograd. Yeah. And um, my friend, um, Professor Alexander uh, Dvorkin, asked me to to go and give this talk. And it was incredible. I gave a talk to 200 men in black, you know, all these priests with with this stuff on. And um, it's, it's great when you give the simultaneous um, translation thing because you get the laugh. 10 seconds afterwards, <laughs> right. if you get the laugh at all, you know, but right. um, I, they said that I'd got an hour and 40 minutes. And so I wrote to the second, this, this piece, and then I got there and they were starting to come on the stage and, you know, the priests were coming from all over Europe, you know, ones from Jerusalem and Poland and Ukraine, of course, at that time. And um, announcing themselves and this thing just went on interminably um, how pleased they were to be there. It's like, look, couldn't we just stand up as a group and say, we're all really pleased to be here and get on with it. Right. And uh, Sasha turned to me and he said, um, you have half an hour. And I said, I was told I've got an hour and 40 minutes. I've got like however long to, to strip this down. Fortunately, the mayor of, or the head of the Duma in the St. Petersburg uh, parliament declined to come the next day, having been put off. So I got two periods and was able to do the whole thing. So this was a talk that I gave, and the thought was, you know, these people know absolutely nothing about Scientology. What are the important things? What are the vital documents? What's the vital evidence to, to put in front of people? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I will admit I put a little bit of an emphasis on the anti-Christian aspects of Scientology. Mm -hmm. So it's um, really just a, a, a collection of these things. Um, and I, I'm very pleased to say that the talk was split over two days. And after the second one, I was staying in the Lavra, which is sort of like a monastery, quite big. There are only two of them in Russia. And you're at the, the top of Nevsky Prospect. And Nevsky Prospect, when Peter the Great built St. Petersburg in about 1720, this amazing Russian Baroque city, it's just beautiful you know and i i loathe baroque stuff particularly spanish baroque which is like appalling but this is really really looks good and wow. you've got the, the prospect runs right down to to the harbor and at the top of it is the lavra and i get there and because of the danger of scientology they've kind of gone well um we need you to be secure you can stay in the lavra so Couple, hundreds of monks there and all of this stuff and I go there and I it's like a little hotel room and I sleep in it it's only the next day I find out that behind the wall is the altar in the cathedral St Petersburg <laughs> I might have been you know it said that uh, Richard Dawkins says he won't walk in graveyards at night I don't know what he's frightened of given what he professes but right. I, I might have been a bit spooked by this thought that the, the grand altar of this you know and I it was just an incredible time that they, 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 you know, I'm heartbroken about what's happening yeah. between Russia and Ukraine now, because yeah. I saw Russian and Ukrainian priests cuddling each other and being happy together. 
But I, I got to deliver this talk and then sort of thought, well, I many years ago wrote a, a little booklet called The Total Freedom Trap. Um, and I came to revise it around the time I was writing this and went, I don't think this is relevant anymore. I think there's a, a quicker way. I think this booklet, so it's it's available as an audio book. It's available uh, in print. It's available as an ebook. And the thought was, if you've been involved in Scientology and you want to explain it to somebody, then this this is a way to go. Rather than try and hit them with a big book, um, mm -hmm. your book or, or my that Sally's mm -hmm. book, the Peace Blue Sky, which are fairly thorough, give them give them the uh, the high points. So um, we have um, we start off with the UFO cult, which I think people ought to know, um, and. Um, so the beginning of the book is, and you've heard this before, 75 million years ago, the evil Prince Zenu rounded up the populations of 76 plants and brought them to Earth where their souls were dropped into volcanoes, blown up with hydrogen bombs and gathered on electronic ribbons to be clustered together. This sounds like the creation of a science fiction writer. And it is. <laughs> um and we then go on to hard selling. So we've got um, Les Dane's wonderful textbook. Big ah, Green. yes. Yes. Sales closing techniques. Um, and I, I was quite surprised coming to it, you know, that um, never, capital letters, never let anyone simply walk out and never let a student leave or quit. Introvert him like a bullet. You have to be willing to invade privacy very definitely. Recruits don't have any rights. And this whole, when you kind of filter it through and you're just looking at the, the pure malevolence of L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. Um, you know, he says, uh, in what is life worth the importance of hard sell? Hard sell, capital letters, is a must, capital letters, in dissemination and selling of services and materials. Elsewhere, he says, you tell him that he's going to sign up right now and he's going to take it right now. One does not describe something. One commands something. You will find that a lot of people are in a more or less hypnotic daze and they respond to direct commands. There it is. And out. There it is. Hard sell means yeah, insistence that's the that thing. people buy. That's right. That's the thing that we talk about when we say Hubbard was really obvious about this. Like It wasn't like he had to be real subtle. Oh. In his policies, in his directives to the staff, and that's what you're reading from there, mm -hmm. this is how he directs Scientology staff to deal with the general public. They have derogatory words for the general public. They think less of them as people because they believe that they are enshrouded with this reactive mind that keeps them in this, in this hypnotic daze mm -hmm. all the time. And when you talk when we talk about how you dehumanify somebody, dehumanize them, right, to make it okay to treat them and control them and and enslave them or dominate their minds, this is how Scientologists do it. It's a syrupy, sweet kind of gross thing of these poor, degraded human beings out there who are so screwed up, they don't even know how bad off they are. And it's only our beneficence that, you know, that that is our our wonderful empathy and caring that we will take the time to deal with their awful reactive minds. And and you have to control them and dominate them because they can't control themselves. You know, that's the whole spirit of what it what you're imbued with or indoctrinated with as a Scientology staff member. And I was I mean, getting that at 17 years old. Yeah. I was being told this is how the world is. You know? And you, you talk, I mean, the description of, as you say, raw meat, dead yeah. in the head, wogs. Yeah. And of course, wogs in the UK is the N word. That's right. Not a word we use. That's um, right. Which that I had no idea of, by the way, when I was in. As an American, I, we had no idea that was how culturally inappropriate that was. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it's uh, mistakenly people say it means worthy oriental gentleman. It does right. not. It means somebody whose skin color is darker than the average uh, Briton. That's um, right. Then there's there's some stuff about um, um, Ron Hubbard, the source. It's got a nice little picture down here of his first novel, Buckskin Brigades. 
That's right. Of course, he would later claim in various places that he became a full blood brother. That's a brave, uh, an active warrior with the Blackfoot people at the age of two, at the age of four, or at the age of six. He makes all three claims. Wow. Of course, in Buckskin Brigades, his first novel in, I think, 1934, he says um, he got this information about the Blackfoot people from someone who'd actually known them. There's no claim that he knew them. And when his aunt, Margaret Roberts, who was eight years older than him and was in the same household as him from him being six months old to being 12 years old, when she was asked by Russell Miller about the Blackfoot, she said, I don't know what you're talking about. Exactly. <laughs> So, yeah, and he's a nuclear Hubbard physicist. Wide? What, what's this now? <laughs> yeah. And we have um, his uh, um, Caribbean motion picture expedition. This is, uh, so I, I wanted to have the actual documents. So this is yes. a contemporary news article from 1932. Yes. Um, L. Ron Hubbard heads movie crews among old piratical haunts. And... Of course, the article about what a complete failure it was was signed L. Ron Hubbard, that, that the, stu the students were trying to sue him because they had achieved none of their objectives. They hadn't enacted any pirate battles at all. In fact, they hadn't got to their destinations. They'd had to go home. Um, right. Then and we have his... And, and, this is only, and this is actually important, not only because of the failure and the, and the nonsense that Hubbard engaged in, but also the fact that he later told incredibly tall tales about this stuff uh, to Scientologists about how successful he was during this time period, how this was something he was, he demonstrated early leadership ability, and this was something that he had pulled off and organized when, in fact, the fact of the matter is that L. Ron Hubbard couldn't organize his way out of a wet paper bag. And that is, and that's what's demonstrated by your book in these in these clippings as to why these are uh, so relevant to to the cult of greed mm. motif here. You know, yeah, and and we find you know his literary career that this is fantastic magazine to which he contributed. Um, then we have this wonderful picture. A friend of mine actually went through the campaign ribbons here, and Hubbard hadn't been awarded any of them. You know, he had a sharpshooter badge from when he was 16 as a Marine cadet, and he had service medals from the three areas of the war that he'd served in. That was it. And yet he displayed, I mean, there's um, a fake um, a notice of departure from the Navy that's got 21 medals listed on it, which yeah. Scientology didn't use to hand out. And then they accidentally, they gave one to somebody who brought it to me. And it's got on it Purple Hearts, I think, with um, with an oak cluster where they were rewarded with a palm if there was a second one. So he's got a lie about the medals, which would not have been. And then, of course, right. you get pictures of um, Jack Parsons, Marjorie Cameron, who was the to be the mother of Babylon, the mother of the uh, Scarlet Whore, Scarlet Whore. Right. And here's the, the man with the funny hat who was... Hubbard's greatest inspiration, Alistair Crowley, um, who also had a thing about triangles, just like like Hubbard did. Yeah, that's right. He's wearing one on his head. That's <laughs> if you, you can't see the photos on the audio of this, but uh, if you look up Alistair Crowley, you're going to be ready for some laughter. This guy is, he took himself so seriously. And when you really look at his collected works, you're just, what are you fucking talking about, dude? Mm -hmm. I can't decipher that guy's works and there are people who tell me it's very deep and i think it's just very deep piles of uh, of nonsense is what i think yeah i mean crowley's a fascinating figure but he's um he's not an academic he's not deeply versed in things that that, that he looked at and when you look at um people who are deeply versed and you know say good aldous huxley with the perennial philosophy which I don't think is deeply versed enough. I'm very much of the point of view that that there is no perennial philosophy. The fact that there are certain commonplaces between belief systems, you have to also look at the disagreements between them. Mm. And they are profound, the yes. disagreements between Buddhism and Christianity, for example. Yes. Profound. Yes, that's um, right. But Crowley had put forward a very simplistic view of this, whereby all of the, the deities, you know, you could say, well, you know, the Greeks believed in 
Artemis, the, the, the Romans believed in Diana. This is Hathor to, to the Egyptians. This is highly relevant because this was the divinity that Hubbard latched upon, the hunter, the huntress. Um, they are not the same thing in those systems, but I, Omar Garrison was, was hired by Scientology and paid a large amount of money to write a biography of Hubbard. He'd already written two pro-Scientology books, yep. which are relatively accurate, um, though they do miss a lot of information to get there. Omar was then paid a lot more money not to publish the biography. She paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to shut up. And one day he arrived on my doorstep, thousands of miles away, no appointment, knocks on the door. I've got Omar Garrett. I've never met him, never heard from him. He's right there. He comes into my house and he says, I've come to see you because I'm tired of having my door kicked in. But the Scientology keep coming to try and get back the tens of thousands of pages that he had from the Hubbard archive, which oh. showed the real story of, of, of Aaron Hubbard. And he said, I'm tired of them doing it. And so I want them to know, I'm going to tell them I've been to see you. And if I'm attacked in any way again, I'm going to give you all of the documents. And as a sign of good faith, this is the blood ritual. So here's this document that, that was named during the Armstrong case in 1984 in LA. And he said, you can't copy it. You can't make notes, but you can read it. And it's a handwritten L. Ron Hubbard, that famous handwriting. L. Ron Hubbard signing a pact with the Egyptian goddess Hathor, the destroyer of mankind, as she is known in some texts. She's like many of the, the deities she has. She's Janus face. She, she's the, a spotted cow that is the feeder of, of humanity, but she's also the destroyer of mankind and he that was his that was his thing all the, and all the way through scientology as well i don't think he ever lost that set of beliefs i think that was always kept hidden yeah. from us yeah. and something else was going on which, which is a conversation we've had about the magic before that's right um, it's kind of it reminds me of the um if you're if you, I, I i tell me if i'm accurate but it reminds me of the um the bad Ghost, the bad, uh, evil monster uh, in Ghostbusters, <laughs> had this Egyptian. We're really sort of getting to the deep went, theological perspective here. Yeah, I mean, I'm just sort of thinking if it, it, it just it just makes me smile to think that was the entity that L. Ron Hubbard it, it entered into a pact with and, and worshipped in a way. Right? Is is the Ghostbusters monster? Right? It's like yeah. okay, that's Pretty who much. it was. And yeah. And and we we as I say we went through Hubbard and the occult in in some yeah. and there's there's a thing on on my channel in fact there are a couple of things on my channel about this which Spike will probably grace us with in in the description, um, but you you have this this confusion this idea of this guy who is claiming that he's a wounded war hero a nuclear physicist who studied with gurus in the east none of this is true none of it is mm -hmm. even vaguely true, and he. The particular claim is that he cured himself of his war wounds. Uh, he was uh, crippled with physical injuries to hip and back. I love the use of that word, physical, in case we thought they were metaphysical or something like that. And injured optic nerves, he claims. Now, having gone through all 800 pages of his Navy record twice and the second time with an officer who'd served at the same time as Hubbard, and so we went through his record, and showed that what Fletcher Prouty was saying about there being a sheep-dipped file was complete nonsense. Yep. Um, it, it rested upon the idea that it has, he has the number 16 at the left-hand top of all of his orders. And in fact, my friend also had the number 16. And it does not mean Navy intelligence. It means, as it says in the file, if Fletcher Prouty had looked, you're a member of the US Navy Reserve. And Hubbard joined the Navy before the war and was put into the Reserve because yep. they didn't have a place for him. And then he served in public relations and as an intelligence officer, meaning he gave talks about how to recognize enemy shipping and enemy planes, and he censored letters. He never worked as an intelligence agent. Right. But in this period where he's meant to develop this wonderful technique while he's at Oak Knoll Naval Hospital, we find here uh, this letter, which comes from the Veterans Administration files, and this is a letter of 1947. 
It's dated um, October the 15th. It's signed L. Ron Hubbard. And he says, um, he's at, this is a request for treatment. Um, after trying and failing for two years to regain my equilibrium in civil life, I am utterly unable to approach anything like my own competence. This is a man who's claiming to have cured himself with Dianetics. Mm -hmm. My last physician informed me that it might be very helpful if I were to be examined and perhaps treated psychiatrically or even by a psychoanalyst. Toward the end of my service, I avoided, out of pride, any mental examinations. This is during the year he spent in Oatenall Hospital. Hoping that time would balance a mind which I had every reason to suppose was seriously affected. You're not kidding. <laughs> I cannot account for nor rise above long periods of moroseness and suicidal inclinations, and I've newly come to realise that I must first triumph above this before I can hope to rehabilitate myself at all. Now, he didn't rehabilitate himself at all. And within about 15 months of that, in January 1949, he's writing a letter from Savannah, Georgia, to his literary agent, Barry Ackerman, saying he's worked out this treatment, this approach, whereby you can rape women without them knowing about it he said that he actually did say that that's not an exaggeration or hyperbole no. and he doesn't say anything about any benefit of this from this method that's right it's in fact a form of hypnotism that that he's been working on that's so, right and and back up one second to that letter i just want to ask you this was the basis of his continuing claims all the way through the 1960s to get va payments uh, for disabilities. Is that right? He received disability payments until the day of his death. Oh, all the way until the 80s. Yeah, wow. he, was, he was getting $38 a month um, because his disability was considered to be relatively trivial. Right. Um, right. But he begged he, for that money. In he those did. Lives. Yeah. And of course, we have the famous affirmations where, where he's getting himself ready for the examinations and yeah, when the examination's over, you'll be fine again. So That's thing. right. That's um, right. Profoundly involved with hypnotism. And it, it, if you want to, we, we both know about phobia induction and the way that you make people frightened of things. And Scientologists are frightened of psych, any word that begins psych. The, the yep. prefix psych is not allowed. And that's because of Hubbard's fear of it. And it works two ways. One is that he was psychiatrically ill. And no two ways about that. There was That's something right. badly wrong with this man. He was often highly, you know, as he says, periods of moroseness and suicidal inclinations. He was often yeah. highly distressed. And that happened throughout Scientology. I interviewed quite a number of people from Barbara Cloden, his girlfriend in 1950, who became a psychologist later. And she said he'd have, you know, he'd spend four days in bed. He wouldn't get out of bed when he's writing Science of Survival. <laughs> you know, four days. Four days in bed. Yeah. And then uh, Jim Dinkalsi, the late Jim Dinkalsi, who, who looked after him in Queens, New York at the end of 72, beginning of 73, um, because they were frightened that he was going to be, if anybody knew where he was, he'd be extradited in the French case that was going yeah. on. Um, and he talks about, you know, these terrible low moods. John McMaster, who was the world's first real clear in 1965, he told me that Hubbard was so often sat crying in the corner. You know, the, this idea of this bulletproof, brilliant, superhuman man, it, it's complete nonsense. It's a fabrication and something that he had to perpetuate so that people would follow him. That's right. Um, and you can, you can actually see it on film when you watch him. We got the opportunity to, uh, to watch that Afternoon at St. Hill video a couple of weeks ago. First time I'd ever seen it. And uh, boy, was that interesting to watch Hubbard on film years out, you know, years removed from Scientology. And so I'm no longer having to engage in the cognitive dissonance of making him into a hero. Mm. And watching him fumble bumble his way through this video, this, this film that he made, mm. and the fact that he chose to shoot this and then send it out in the quality and state that it was in <laughs> with him presenting the way that he was, you know, he looks incompetent in every single shot. He, he looks uncertain. He looks, uh, he's fumbling around. This is my OT guru. 
you know, it was it was quite illuminating to mm-hmm. to do that this many years out to see original something I had not seen before. Mm. Right. So I could respond to it like, oh, this is completely new to me. Yeah. It was yeah. a whole different and picture of the man. You know? Absolutely. I, I mean, I'm, we have a, a copy of The Shrinking World of Aaron Hubbard on on on, on the channel. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I'm a big fan of Charlie Nairn who made it. Incredible man. Um, but seeing Hubbard sitting and blinking at the camera and this man who's meant to be the world's leading expert on public relations. Yeah. And, you know, he just can't hack it. He can't do it. You know, I, I had no second wife, yes. <laughs> first wife and a third wife. That's I'm not very really good at, he did say he wasn't very really good at mathematics. So to be fair, um, and, um, your, your followers believe in reincarnation pause. Uh, so, sorry, do you believe in reincarnation pause? Your followers believe. Oh yes, they believe. Yeah. Oh yes. <laughs> and uh, I have no Swiss bank. I have one Swiss bank account. It's like <laughs> he doesn't know where he is or what's going on. That's right. And, as you say, we we saw him through coloured lenses. We we rose tinted spectacles. We wanted him to be this wonderful daddy figure who who had resolved all the the, the profound questions of the universe. And we come away, and it's just like wet tissue paper. That's right. There's nothing there. That's exactly so, right. Um, and I, I sort of go through a little bit about um, the second wife he didn't have. Oh, yes. There she is. married. Era. And onto, of course, the famous OTO cross, which becomes the Scientology crossed out cross. That's right. Or double cross, as I like to think of it. <laughs> then, of course, you have Ron auditing tomatoes. Yeah, there it is. I und- I couldn't understand why it was that, you know, before he sticks the nail into the tomato to to give it the pain, he's already put the crocodile clips into it. Right. I mean, <laughs> and of all the stupidities, you know, the if if we want to go off onto the topic of nutrition, the only thing you can eat without killing anything is fruit. Take the seeds out carefully, but the fruit is not alive. So mm-hmm. the idea that the plant is, you know, why wasn't he checking the stems of the plant? He also at this time claimed that that he had created the ever-bearing tomato because the man was so ignorant of gardening that he didn't realize that tomatoes are perennial plants, which we grow as hardy half-hardy annuals in this country because the winter will kill them outdoors. But you can over, I've overwintered tomato plants myself, so I know this is true in, in trying to hybridize them. So so he invented this thing and and then of course what he's doing is subjecting tomato seeds to nuclear radiation um which is um th- there's an organic grapefruit called the ruby red or i think it's the star red and people sell this organic grapefruit without realizing it was originally made by nuclear mutation <laughs> i'm not sure that's really okay it's not as good as the florida pink anyway you know so can we eat grapefruit well, he- the florida pink you know? And I remember him making claims in his lectures about this because I was so fascinated with it as a Scientologist. I remember him making claims about record making, record breaking crop sizes and um, and growth with these plants because Mm -hmm. they were um, he talked very specifically about how they were monitoring the humidity factors, the temperatures, the soil content, all this stuff in these greenhouse conditions, hot house, he called them a hot house, mm-hmm. and how this was so carefully controlled and how you could precisely, like with precision, make mm-hmm. micro adjustments in these things and end up with these bountiful crops. And I think back to this now because I sort of took all that in at the time. And then I'm thinking then and now, well, how come nobody else ever heard about it then? Like, how come how come nobody ever heard anything about this? Like, if it was that successful and that incredible in terms of results, people would be banging down a path to your door. You know what I mean? Like, it, it there would be interest in this, Ron. And it's the same way how he talks in the 50s about how we can, ha- you know, cure psychosis. Well, we have the cure for that. We can figure that out. No problem. If you had I'm- a cure for psychosis, <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, like he just he just tosses these claims off as though they're nothing. And and they just kind of go in one ear and out the other. And, and, and in Scientology, you just kind of 
oh yeah, well, we're just part of this super group and we just have all of it. And, and it just, you just don't really think the thought through, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a weird phenomenon now that I think back on it. Isn't it? I, I mean, his claims in what, 1952, that, that he could cure cancer and leukemia. Yeah. And raise people from the dead. Yeah. And yeah. you sort of, it, it, talking with Karen de la Carriere a year or so back, she said, you know, it's the same every time you say none of these claims are true. And the, the Scientologist looks at you and says, didn't you have any wins? Right. <laughs> that's right. Didn't you ever get high on this stuff? You know, that's right. That's and that's basically what they're asking is, didn't you ever get high on this? Because the high justifies all of it. I, you know, we keep we keep circling back around to that because it's such a powerful point. Hmm. You, you just go blind. You just yeah. do. You just go blind to it, you know, and I, and it's just it's never as stark to you as to when you come out of the euphoria and come down from the bliss and look at reality in a different way that you go, oh, my God, was I fooling myself? Because that's because that's what ultimately what we're doing is we're fooling ourselves. Yeah, and, I mean, when I first, you know, and again, it's one of those phobic words, hypnotism. But as a Scientologist, even though Hubbard said frequently in the 1950s, to understand what we're doing, you have to understand hypnotism. You know, it's a clear, bold statement made by Hubbard himself. And he yeah. recommends books. Uh, Hypnotism Comes of Age by Wolfram Rosenthal, for example, which I read. And Hubbard recommends the book, guys. If you want to understand Scientology, you've got to read the books he recommends. 25 Lessons in Hypnotism is another one. Um, and looking at these things, you find that, that this is what he's actually working with. He's working with this capacity to, to get people to believe something. And when I first saw descriptions of hypnotism, having been as phobic as any other Scientologist about the brain hypnotism, not so much for psychiatry, I'd met a nice psychiatrist, so I, I knew that the broad generality that Hubbard used about psychiatrists was not in fact true. Um, mm -hmm. But nonetheless, this, this thing of, I, I saw a, a list of, of states that are induced during hypnotism. And the first thing on the list was euphoria. I'm kind of going, very good indicators. Mm -hmm. oh dear. So if you repeat something over and over again, you will get to the point where you dissociate and you trip out. You space That's out. That's it. And and that and your is needle is floating. The, that that's right. And and that is the end phenomena of every single Scientology process. Yeah, very every good one of them. VGIs, right? Euphoria. And you just you literally just broke down the anatomy of a Scientology auditing right there. Yeah, and and that's all you guess, and then you get that. Of course the. Uh, Built into that is is the pretty much three day cycle. It's going to be variable for for people, but yep. um, you see it after faith healing that that somebody will you know get up and walk from their wheelchair, and three days later they are in the most agonizing pain they've ever been in because they've now stressed muscles that have not been properly used for a long time. That's right. And this becomes the roller coaster. This becomes the idea in Scientology of. PTSness, this terrible, bizarre expression, potential trouble sourceness. That's right. <laughs> that, um, <laughs> that you are now uh, post traumatic stress, which is what Scientology does in fact induce. Um, that you are now down because you've lost the high. And that idea of a perpetual high, it's written into so many. Um, religious systems, this idea that you'll achieve bliss. I, as a Buddhist, and it which persisted for me through Scientology and beyond, as a Buddhist, I got to about age 50, about 20 years ago, and sort of went, people are trying to get blissed out with this. They're meditating to get blissed out. That's avoidance. That's just not looking at what's happening in the world. You, you know, And while it is good to have you know, deep breathing, I, I'm all for mindfulness. I'm not that interested in meditation. I learned in a Zen monastery. Nobody's going to impress me with this stuff. It's the breathing that's the important thing. So you yeah. breathe slowly. You feel better. Your cortisol release goes down. You're less panicked. That's great. 
but then investing in this idea of being in this state all the time. No, you know, the, we need our memory. We need the past. We need to be aware of what's around us. So fitting ourselves into this happy, happy, happy state, it's, it's a concentration camp for the mind. It's not a beneficial thing to do. Uh, and That's sadly, right. a whole society is now trying to do it through mindfulness. So exactly then we, right. we move on to some pleasant images. These are the oh, yeah. Commodore's messengers in their hot pants who yes. served Ron Hubbard. That's and here right. we have we a photograph like the from the Scientology publication, Auditor Number 41. And um, we've identified the smiling man here. That's Beren Berez, who was thrown out of Scientology for using one of Scientology's vessels in California to smuggle large quantities of drugs from Mexico to the US. So here's ethics. Oops. But I was amazed when I finally, you know, I'd, inside, I'd never seen this thing when I was in Scientology. And the picture credits, the... Um... And the picture, by the way, is two people uh, manhandling a person off of their feet, up vertically, or rather, they're carrying them horizontally, mm -hmm. about to throw them off the side of the boat. Yeah, and it says students are thrown overboard for gross out tech and bequeathed to the deep, exclamation mark. What got me, it's a double spread in order to 41, and it says the photo credit is L. Ron Hubbard. So if anybody thinks he didn't know about this, and of course I've interviewed many people who were ordered to be overboarded, 25 to 40 feet, the high diving board in our swimming baths is 14 so 25 to 40 feet, thrown into the water in Corfu Harbour, where other ships were letting out their human refuse. So there's human excrement in the water. You might be blindfolded, your ankles tied, thrown over. And it might be for being two minutes late, gross out tech. It might be for that. I interviewed yeah. um, Neville Chamberlain, who's not to be confused with Neville Chamberlain, of course. Um, <laughs> one of them was quite thin, the other wasn't nev was he's an incredible guy you yeah know, i really liked him yeah um but he's a con artist what can we say he's a guy who um that hubbard devised this term called doing a nev um nev was one of the 19 original c project members he was 16 when hubbard drafted him in and doing a nev meant you've done exactly what the issue says and nothing <laughs> of what the issue wants you know you've followed the letter but not the spirit and that was called doing a nev and neville the first time i asked him about overboarding and he was the first person i did ask um so i went and brushed it off and then a week or so later i got him at the opportune moment and i said what was it what was it really like and and he collapsed it's just it was terrifying you know you'd you didn't know if you were going to be on the list, so you'd take your watch off, you'd take your shoes off, you'd, you'd be ready to be hurled overboard. Kind of going, so he went from developing a technique that's going to relieve trauma, Dianetics, to traumatizing people. Yeah. How does this work? You know, how does this make any kind of sense? Yeah, that's right. And he became tyrannical at that point. Um, let me move on to the um, racket exposed where yeah. he is saying that we, we need to... Uh, this, again, was in the auditor um, newsletter, which was sent out to all Scientologists, and it lists a bunch of people, and it says they're declared suppressive persons for pretending to have and distribute forged and altered upper-level materials. And it says um, any C organization member contacting any of them is to use auditing process R245. Oh, there it is. Which there is it. route two from creation of human ability. And when he demonstrated this in the original lecture, he had a Colt 45 and he yep. fired a bullet through the floor. That's yep. what R245 is. So here we have him openly ordering murder. That's um, right. He there's called no it record instant, that anybody did it, but... <laughs> instant exteriorization process. That's it. Frowned upon in our society at this time. Yep. Yeah. That's the quote. It's right there in the original book. work. And he made mention of it in other places as well. This was this was a joke that was really insider baseball language for, you know, go kick the shit out of these people for me. I'm completely okay with that. 
Well, the board members of the uh, Australian, the Victoria Inquiry, Kevin Victor Anderson, there was an R245 order put out on him. And it's one of those kind of um, responsibilities of leaders, the Simon Bolivar yes. policy, where he says, of course, the leader doesn't need to know what you're doing, but go and do it anyway. That's right. Let me have a little handwritten well, note. I mean, let yep. me say this real fast, by the way, just to relate, just to just to harp on this for just a second, because mm -hmm. it's important to how Scientology actually operates and how they operated from the very beginning. This was demonstrated quite well on film by Paul Thomas Anderson in The Master, hmm. where the Freddie hmm. Quell character, the, the follower character, would go and literally go beat up on people who had been critical, openly critical or hostile to his guru. Hmm. And that's exactly what Hubbard was encouraging and ordering here. This hmm. is not subtle. I just want to underline this and boldface it for a second because these these little points like that can feel like minutia and get missed and mm -hmm. and that yet this R two forty five thing was actually used in multiple places and was a direction by Hubbard in code language to go you know to give people the authority to go do horrible things to other people and in a way it was the original version of fair gaming absolutely and it the that contempt that is shown for the non-Scientologist becomes much worse when you're dealing with somebody who's a critic of Scientology or, or an ex-Scientologist. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, Alron Hubbard Jr., and I take the view, you know, I, I was in touch with him back in 84. He was very helpful. Um, and he was very open. He, he was very, very much, you know, I'm a chip off the old block. I'm like my father treat me that way. You know, don't, I'm not an upstanding citizen. I've done awful things. And I came to believe that what he had, what he re reported from his father, so he said his father, you know, stood at the gates of hell and, and took the magic from the same guy that gave it to Hitler and this kind of stuff. These are stories he was told by his father. So they're stories told by Aaron Hubbard. But when he relates something as his own experience, I, I've i never been able to fault him. Um, there are stories, however, I can't prove, him claiming that his father had murdered seven prostitutes. Um, wow. Uh, that wow. he had uh, flown cocaine into the US with his father, uh, along with the mafia, working with the mafia. These are things, they just seem outrageous. And one would need to see evidence of them. They're frightening <laughs> statements. But I can confirm that during the Philadelphia doctorate course, there was a fight. Some marshals came along and Nibs Hubbard got into a fist fight with them. And Nibs was a big guy. And he said, you know, whenever anybody needed handling between 1952 and 1959, when he left because his dad wouldn't pay him enough money to keep his kids. In that time, there would be physical um, intimidation of people who who opposed Ron Hubbard. Um, so just to you know um, underline that this is a handwritten note from L. Ron Hubbard, which it may be some people haven't seen. Mm. Uh, it's right here, printed in the little book. It says October the thirtieth, and it's um, called anybody, and it has the L. Ron Hubbard monogram. By well, that's in his handwriting. If anyone does anything to get any of these organizations in bad publicity, such as narcotics charges, drunk driving, or other unsavory data, I have a policy. I will beat their teeth in personally. Sincerely, Alan Hubbard. So what do you yeah, what are we meant to make of that? Either it's a genuine threat or he's an imbecile. There <laughs> don't seem to be any other choices. It's either childish bravado or it's a real threat. That's right. Um, and we would always re reframe it, depending on who you were as a cult member and your value system, you could say, or your moral foundations, right? Mm -hmm. You always end up reframing this crap, reinterpreting it in your own mind to, oh, well, he's just a tough talker. Oh, uh, he just means he's, you know, he's not really going to go punch the guy in the face. He's just going to bring that level of discipline and and seriousness to this to really show how important this is. Like, this is how I would, as a Scientologist, make that make sense to me. 
because it wouldn't make sense to me to just go punch somebody in the face. But I could take that as a, as a um, metaphor or something, right. You know, something like that. Um, and that's how I would, that's how I would interpret those kind of things when I was in the church. And it really shocks me looking back on it, how easy it was to do. And, because and I he, do that many times. He actually put the concept forward by redefining the idea of being reasonable. Mm -hmm. So he's saying that, that when you see something not for what it actually is, but you justify it, you intellectualize it, you excuse it, then that's okay. being reasonable. And we shouldn't be reasonable with Scientology. That's right. If Ron Hubbard said it, as the technical degrades in keeping Scientology working say, he meant it. And That's we're right. not allowed any interpretation. There is no leeway. So, you know, I can't imagine L. Ron Hubbard in a fist fight with anybody. I think he was a sissy boy, but, but you know, it would have been interesting to watch. Oh, come okay. on. He learned judo from his uncle as a kid. He stood on a nine-foot tall fence and beat up the entire McClory gang and he used judo to defeat those guys who attacked him in the street when he was uh what otherwise occupied in the hospital or something what was that <laughs> uh, yeah it was uh, three petty officers in in Hollywood on the 25th yes. of January 1945 um an issue called communication and isness from the late 50s where he makes that claim uh, Russell Miller I'm not sure that he got into bareface messiah um obviously I worked very closely with Russell he had my manuscript to base his book on because uh, I couldn't get a publisher at that time. And I'd just given in. I approached 50 publishers, 11 of them said they'd like to do it, but there was no money in it. Russell being, a, I think, the highest paid journalist in the UK at the time working for the Sunday Times, could get a publisher. He'd already got books on Hefner and, and Getty out. Um, and so around he went to... To, to find out. And one of the stories he got, and I don't think it's in Bareface Messiah, the four members of this family that Elrond Hubbard said he'd beaten up, he'd jumped off the fence and beaten up. Um, Hubbard was claiming to have been, I don't know, nine or 10 years old at this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The oldest right. member of this family, he traced them. They really did exist. The oldest member was 18. So how a 10-year-old Right, a fairly insignificant ten-year-old, I'm afraid to say, um, had managed to beat them all up. It, he lived in his imagination. He lived in this world where he was a superhero. He That's was a, an operating Thetan. He was a god, and you know he could. There, there was a statement made in Scientology which confused the hell out of me, which was that you could change the future, you could change the present, and you could change the past. Now I could see how you could change the future. That makes sense. Changing the present, well, you can give it a try. Changing the past. And eventually, I learned the Elrond Hubbard technology of changing the past. It's what we call lying. <laughs> exactly. And I think, you know, you have to wonder, and it's really purely subjective. You know, you have to wonder, though. Did he just remember his life this way? Or did he know he was... You know, it doesn't really matter one way or the other. The practical consequences are the same. But you always have to wonder, you know, did he really know he was just full of shit? I, or, I found it, was this it thing. Secret life of Walter Mitty. You know what I mean? He just like, <laughs> it's like, the, no, man, this is my life. <laughs> the, the other one is Billy Liar, which is, um, and, and there's a movie of it with, I think, Tom Courtney in from the 60s. And it's, even closer to the Aaron Hubbard story, I really wanted to to make a movie when um, what's his the, the going south uh, Paul, um, the, the film director who came out of Scientology. Um, oh, oh, um, Paul Haggis. Paul Haggis. I was in touch with him briefly, and I, I went look. Uh, great movie. You take Billy Liar and you put Aaron Hubbard into it. Now Billy Liar is about a young man who he, you see on the screen what he imagines, and then you see the reality. And right. I just thought that would be a great thing to do with Ron Hubbard. So there's a there's a point where Billy Billy is upset with what's being said to him in, in his mum's kitchen. And so he imagines himself with a Tommy gun mowing the people down. And, you know, L. Ron Hubbard, that, you know, it. but Paul Haggis said he didn't want to do that. So 
you know, if, if there are any movie directors out there, I'd love to work with you. And, and we can certainly get a lot closer to the Ron Hubbard story than The Master did. Um, it's an interesting film. But while yes. they were doing it, the, the rewrites were coming in daily because the lawyers were saying you can't say that because it's quite evidently based on Ron Hubbard. The Philip Seymour Hoffman character is Hubbard. That's and right. they just moved it further and further away. So, yeah. you know, now he's dead. We can do what we like. They can't sue us. Right. Okay. Um, perhaps the most sensational document that that I encountered in researching, and of course I encountered a lot of sensational documents, a lot of stuff that had never seen the light of day, um, a lot of them letters. And there was an instance where it, 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 Gordon J. Melton, the apologist for Scientology, um, who thankfully is no longer apolog apologizing for them, um, said that the reason that Russell Miller and, and the likes of Russell Miller and me, myself, couldn't actually tell the true story of Ron Hubbard is because we didn't have access to the archives. Now, the first thing I would say is, look, you can write about the Kim family without having their diaries. You know, that's a stupid idea. That's right. But I did have our access to the archives. I'm going to admit this publicly now because it's you, Chris, and I know it's safe. You won't tell anyone. No, no, it's just between us, John. While Russell was finishing his book up, a friend of mine was given a letter from the archives to date, and they didn't realize that he was a friend of mine. And he gave me a copy of this letter, and he said it dates to August of 1938, and it starts, Dear Skipper, the term he used for his first wife. He did have a first wife, by the way. Um, Polly, Margaret yep. Grubb, Margaret Louise Grubb. And this letter caused a little bit of a rift between Russell and, and I because the, the guy who'd given it to me said, look, if this ever goes public, they'll work out it was me. And I'm in a very sensitive situation. I've got a huge collection of material. Scientology material, enormous collection, the biggest private collection anywhere. And he wanted to sell it, you know, and it was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. And he knew he could only sell it to Scientologists. So if he was declared suppressive, that would be gone. So it was very significant. He'd spent decades building this collection and just, mm. just unbelievable. Four rooms full of material. Wow. And the people would come out from gold to, you know, David Miscavige's people would come out to look at this and there was a room they were never shown, the black room, the room where all the negative stuff was. Now, I had access to all four of the rooms. Um, I'd already written Blue Sky by the time uh, I met the guy, but um, the chapter on Wichita and what happened with Don Purcell comes completely from him. That was wow. material I didn't have. And the stuff about Jack Parsons suing Ron Hubbard in Florida came from from him and a, another guy that he was working with but he said to me look show this letter to russell and i said I, I don't think that's safe you know you're in such a position the other thing was he didn't want to be harassed you know, right oddly enough right and um so the deal was that russell could have a copy as long as he promised not to use it he used it i got a phone call when russell because I, I was there from the before contracts were signed with Bareface Messiah, all the way through, I was the only paid researcher through the 18 months it went on. Um, had a great relationship with Russell. He's an incredible guy, really lovely guy, and a, a brilliant biographer, absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Um, but we got to this point where I get a call from one of his lawyers saying, uh, Russell's too scared to call you because of what he's done. And I'm sort of, I'm sorry. He said, look, Scientology have sued to get an injunction against publication in England of the, of the book. And every document that they've questioned came from you, all of them. Okay. And we can't win without you. But Russell's quoted the 1938 letter. Right. And so it, that was really difficult. It's like, I've got to protect this book. Mm -hmm. I'm furious. Um, my friend was harassed. Um, he couldn't sell his collection. In the end, he got about a quarter of what it was worth, about $100,000, uh, because um, 
it was bought by somebody who was opposed to Scientology. Um, but this letter is the most significant document in all of Scientology. It's uh, been registered by Scientology. The copyright is claimed by Author Service Incorporated. You can get it um, from the Library of Congress if, if you want a copy. And um, there's a part of it here. Um, Personal immortality is only to be gained through the printed word, barred note, or painted canvas, or hard grabite. I think he meant granite. Foolishly, perhaps, but determined nonetheless, I have high hopes of smashing my name into history so violently that it will take a legendary form, even if all the books are destroyed. That goal is the real goal, as far as I am concerned. There it is. There it is. And that's what I base all of my statements on when you hear me talk about L. Ron Hubbard achieving immortality by living on, on, the, on, on the, in, the, in the, the minds and hearts of his followers. That's exactly what I'm thinking about when I'm, when I'm saying that. Because that was the goal. And he yep. was playing about it. 1938. Hmm. You know, this is pre-Scientology. This is life goal stuff for him. Yeah. He's 27 years old. And um, he wants to smash his name into history so hard that even if all the books are destroyed, he will be remembered. Um, so if you've ever wondered about the validity or reality of that vault project, it is the ultimate cr creation of his destiny, of his purpose in life, is to immortalize his words, his writings in vaults that will never ever ever fall apart <laughs> so ten thousand years from now there they are mm -hmm. who else is doing that and, I, and the whole no, i've never whole, heard of anybody doing that the whole project behind it the church of spiritual technology which, which i got very involved with in you know while it was being created in the 80s um we managed to because they wanted um, religious tax exemption, we got into the documents they put into the court in Washington. And there you find that Aaron Hubbard left $648 million. That's what he hadn't managed, managed to spend. Wow. Um, it's trivial compared to Mahesh. Mahesh, the, who people call great teacher, Maharishi. I'm not going to call him that. I'm mean, calling yep. him Mahesh. That was his name. He left eight billion, so yeah. much bigger fry than than Ron Hubbard. Yeah. Six hundred forty-eight million dollars. Five hundred million of that went to the Church of Spiritual Technology. Half there a billion dollars. And when it was originally formed, and they were drafting up what it was meant to be for, one of the suggestions was that its purpose was to perpetuate the name L. Ron Hubbard. Yep. Now, in I don't know, about 15 years ago or something, when Marty Rathbun was still considered to be a real human being by people other than myself, um, I never had any time for him. Um, the, the warrior! You know, oh, come on, you know, pathetic narcissist. Come on, sue me, Marty. Um, <laughs> let's see you. Take you on with one arm tied behind my knees. Um <laughs> He put for in his blog, he said this thing that he'd realized that Elrond Hubbard wanted to be deified. It was a matter of apotheosis. We haven't even have special words for it. And so I wrote to him. It's the only time I ever did write to him. And I said, You've just said this in 2014 or whenever. Look to let's sell these people a piece of blue sky, first published in 1990. And there's a chapter which explains, you know, why don't people read this book? It's a comprehensive history of Scientology. It, you know, it, you know, go on to all of the others, read, absolutely read your book. But the grounding, Peace of Blue Sky was written to explain the development of Scientology, the history of this group, and to show the massive contradictions in Ellen right. Hubbard's claims. Where Russell was concerned to give a, a real biography of Hubbard, which he did, and it's excellent. My focus was not that. My focus was to show he was a lying bastard. Right. That not one of the claims he makes is true. And yeah. he contradicts them himself. So, right. and the road to truth must be trod with true steps. Honesty 
is sanity, Oren Hubbard. And his dishonesty was rampant and his insanity was was massive. So right. we then go right. into a little section about claims, and, and we've already talked about some of these. Um, yes. News in brief. Um, so we have, um, this is useful knowledge. With it, the blind again see, the lame walk, the ill recover, the insane become sane, and the sane become saner. Um, cancer has been eradicated. This is These are all 1952. Um, Believe this crap? Uh, cancer has been eradicated. Eradicated. Yeah, you may not have noticed that yet, but since 1952, yeah. <laughs> there has been no cancer. Yeah, just in case you were wondering, right? Dianetics yeah. actually, actually solved all that back then. Got, got rid of it. No problem at all. And yeah. state of clear, which, I mean, in 1950, and it's still there in modern science of mental health, uh, mental science of modern health, that 273 people were successfully treated with this. So there are 273 clears before this book was published on the 9th of May, 1950. We haven't heard from any of them ever. That one. That one. And here in the book, he clear, he says what they've achieved. A clear has over 135 IQ, a vibrant personality. I haven't met any of them. Glowing health, good memory, amazing vitality, self-control, happiness, and more. The most valuable thing you will do for yourself and for your family, friends, and mankind is attain the state of clear. Um, you can achieve clear not in years, but within months through the most advanced technology of the human spirit, Scientology. Um, and as you know, as you know, the claims are just endless, you know, asthma, bursitis, short-sightedness, a whole list of the ailments that Hubbard mm. suffered from. And, exactly. You notice that? Mm. Ulcers. Etc. It's, I, I, it's, it's funny how his pathology is always in the list. Yeah, and n never long sightedness, always short sightedness. That's right, because um, he was wearing spectacles to the day of his death. Um, mm -hmm. Helen O'Brien, who who ran the Hubbard Association of Scientologists during the doctorate course in Philadelphia, said that in the Philadelphia organization, which was the central organization then, they'd put a, a goldfish bowl a big goldfish bowl on the counter for people to throw their spectacles into when their vision was recovered. And she says, nobody ever put their specs in there. Not one person. That's right. And yet, and yet you'll find a Hubbard lecture where he makes this very specific claim that in Phoenix, Arizona, they had a barrel mm. of glasses, not, not even a fish a bowl. barrel. So, <laughs> so he always takes reality and twists it 180 degrees. Yeah. Oh, he always does that. Yeah, and, and I mean, quite often you can see that he's exaggerating or amplifying something that, that did happen. You know, he did go on a four-masted schooner called the Doris mm -hmm. Hamlin uh, to one of the West Indian islands. Calling it the Caribbean Motion Picture Exhibition was a little bit hyperbolic, we might say. Yeah. But... <laughs> When it comes to the claims of cure, there's nothing. That's right. You know, you've just got brief remission of symptoms, which, of course, the people who are with him at the start. It's why nobody seemed to stay with him very long. Because, you know, John Campbell Jr., who made him famous, the editor of Astounding, within a few months, he was saying he's a con man. Art Sepos, Hermitage House, the medical publisher, published Dianetics, withdrew Dianetics as fraudulent and commissioned Dr. Joseph Winter, who'd worked with Hubbard throughout the writing of Dianetics, to write a doctor's report on Dianetics, in which he says, well, I think Dianetics has some good ideas, but this guy's a charlatan, you know. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. It's And it's completely, it's almost checklist perfect, Hubbard's narcissism in light of how we know that they navigate their way through life, that it's always short-term relationships. They don't have long-term friends. It's actually one of the indicators that when you're looking at somebody in their life that you can tell when every when it's always everybody else's fault, when all the bridges are burned in their background in their backstory, you know, when 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 it, and and when you ask them about it, it's always the other person. Mm -hmm. 
right? These are clear signs. Now, obviously, we all have our our issues and problems with people, but I just wanted to point this out because I, I always consider it a life tip. Hmm. You know, when I run into people who who whose entire backstory is mysterious and dark because none of their friends are still their friends <laughs> and they're not family and they're and there's nothing around, you're just like, huh, really? <laughs> yeah. The, absolutely. The the inability to maintain relationships. And when we look at, you know, even say Mary Sue Hubbard, who stayed mm-hmm. with him for longer than anybody else, mm-hmm. but by the end, after she's been to prison in 1981, and she went to prison, she signed a confession more than 200 pages long called a stipulation of evidence and something that all people who've been involved in Scientology should read, where she admits to kidnapping, false imprisonment, bugging, burglary, um, forgery of false government credentials, theft of an inordinate amount of government material. But, you know, kidnapping, false imprisonment, Mm -hmm. she's admitting to this and she admitted to it with a deal that Ron Hubbard wouldn't be tried. He'd be named as an unindicted co-conspirator, as of course Kendrick Moxon, the head of their legal department, as an un- one of the 38 unindicted co-conspirators, and they'd leave it there. So she actually went to prison for him. She was a sick woman. She had hypoglycemia um, and you know, some blood sugar problems. Um, when she came out, she wanted to see him. And he lived another four years, and he never saw her again. And he Mm -hmm. had an order that any letter that she sent him, and she wrote to him very frequently, they should cut out any what what, what Scientologists call entheta, anything negative. And so you've got these letters where a razor blade's been taken to them, and they say, Dear Ron, love Mary Sue. Yeah. (laughs) That's all that's left. I'll Um, best some choice words for him. Yeah, so um, I got there's some stuff about Christianity and about you know uh, you will find the cross as a symbol all over the universe and the Christ legend as an implant a million years ago. Um, we yeah. have uh, what he had to say about hypnotism, hypnosis, um, and, just, and- to, just to be clear on that Christianity thing, real fast. Uh, for mm-hmm. anybody who, who who isn't already in the know on that, Hubbard literally said, "This is not again. We're not. There's no hyperbole here." Hubbard literally said that all of Christianity, all of Catholicism, all the all the beliefs of Jesus as a savior figure and 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 a representative of God, all of it was an implant. Uh, was a was a story that was brainwashed into people spiritually many 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 millennia ago as a control mechanism for populations so that so that these uh these uh space empires could control populations through religion mm. and use a Jesus figure as a messiah figure to to adjust where the population was going when mm. things were getting off the rails that, and that's... he also claimed that that Scientology was completely compatible with Christianity. Yes, and then he said that. <laughs> that's right. And that he- he- he'd, be been to, he'd been to heaven. There's a 1963 right. heaven bulletin where he's been to heaven, and it's like uh, it's like Bush Gardens. That's right, says. Pasadena. <laughs> yeah. It's a kind of a shabby place, he says. <laughs> yeah, I I when I went to Pasadena, I was I was horrified to find that. Not not only was Jack Parsons' house gone, but Bush Gardens is gone as well. They paved paradise and put up a parking lot. That's right. Yeah, so. That's right. I, so, I had the uh, good fortune to grow up five minutes away from Parsons' place. Ah, oh, the Parsonage. <laughs> That's right. So, yeah, I, there, there's a section on hypnosis, uh, and I mistakenly, I noticed I must change that. It's actually hypnosis is a state. Uh, hypnotism uh, is is the practice, but we're all of us now using the word hypnosis because it's such a nice word. But Hubbard would say in 1951 in, in Science of Survival, and I wrote a paper about it, which is on my channel, never believe a hypnotist. So this is what Hubbard said. Yet on the back of his novel Triton, we have um, his leisure hours are devoted to the study and practice of hypnotism. <laughs> <laughs> never believe a hypnotist. That's right. And the and the, and you have to lie to people to control them and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and, I mean, I hope, 
I hope that's given a you know flavor. There's there is so much more in in this tiny little book. Yes. Um, and um, oh look at that. The suppressive group declare Galactic Patrol. The group calling itself the Galactic Patrol is hereby labelled a suppressive. Oh, I'd forgotten about that. Flag conditions <laughs> order, nineteen eighty two. How jolly! Um, oh my goodness! And yeah, oh Paul Haggis is in here. Celebrities and psychiatry. So it, it basically, if if you have somebody and you'd like them to understand, I. I had a friend and I, I sat with him in a diner once in LA and 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 he said, You should have and this guy was in fact a rocket scientist who'd then become a psychologist and throughout this had been a, involved with with Hubbard. Um he was on the second course in Elizabeth, New Jersey in June nineteen fifty, um April no, no, May nineteen fifty. And he'd left Scientology and, you know. We sat there and he said, whenever I mention Scientology to my family, they say it's a religion and we can't talk anymore. And I, I foolishly said, well, you know, the Temple of Set and the Church of Satan are both registered religions in the United States. And he got very angry with me and started shouting at me um, because he was very frustrated that, that he couldn't get it over to his, his family. So if you're having any kind of problem like that, this little book... Um, Scientology the Cult of Greed, I say it's available as an audio book. I do realize that the study of Scientology and study tech has left many people completely unwilling to read anymore. I, I get this. Um, it's a terrible shame to have lost that ability and one yes. should seek to regain it. Um, but nonetheless, it's available as an audio book, as an e-book, um, as, a, as a little print manual. And it's also a, a good refresher for anybody who's been in Scientology. You may not be aware of these things. As I say, it took me one hour and 40 minutes to read it out loud. So that's about how long the audio book is. And um, you can probably read it in less than an hour, as long as your reading has not been impaired by the study technology of Scientology. Yeah, don't um, forget to put your words. Yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. I, I'm very <laughs> careful about that, yeah. <laughs> No, this is uh, this is an important work, and it's a, and it is short, and it is get, and it is to the point. Literally, every page we just walked you through some of this uh, mm -hmm. for a reason. This is a tool. That's the rain. This is not just a book; it's a tool. And if you think about it that way, maybe it'll be in a bit more of a proper perspective for you, mm -hmm. because this there's there's information in here that you can use to 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 help wake people up mm -hmm. if you're clever, if you do it right. Right. If you do it in the in the right way, you're not throwing it at them, you're not yelling it at them, you're not screaming at them, you're actually talking to people, right? And if you can get there and you can do that, this is the information that will get them to go beyond seed planting. This is here's the damn trees. Here's here's what the forest has been consisting of that you've been wandering around in for mm -hmm. years. Here it is. That's what this actually represents and why it's important enough for us to have dedicated a whole podcast to it. Because it's when we talk about waking people up from a cultic experience, especially with Scientology, you've got to have some facts and evidence on your side when you're going to actually have that conversation. Mm. These are the best tools I know how to, uh, to offer people it, to have those conversations. Mm. I mean, I was very concerned to actually... Um copies of the documents directly into the text rather than saying this is what i mean when uh piece of blue sky the original version came out we'd had this ruling in the us in the salinger case which said um you can't print unpublished uh material you can't you can't publish the letters the diaries the guardian orders the harassment orders i had to paraphrase 60 passages in the book to to get it out and that version, the pirate version of it is still out there. Uh, it's called A Piece of Blue Sky. Uh, the remaking of the book, the unabridged edition, which has all 60 of those passages and another 40 for good measure that I thought ought to be in there. Um, that's called Let's Sell These People A Piece of Blue Sky. Now, yep. there's a pirate edition. I think the publisher has given up on it. Kensington Press used to publish it. I think they've now given up. I hope they have. But unfortunately, all over the internet, people have pirated it and put it up. And this, the original version, it's the original version minus at least one chapter because they forgot to type that up with errors in it. 
with the reference summary incorrect, there are 1,100 references. It was very important to me to say, um, you know, if if you're going to, if you know, check me, you know, find out that what I'm saying is true. There, there it is. That's the new edition. There we go. Little, little clouds and the price tags on them. Um, I think it is so important in recovering from Scientology, you cannot just walk away from it. You cannot just say, oh, I'll be fine now. Scientology right. is a system of implanting. It is the most elaborate system of thought reform ever devised. It makes the Chinese communist program look childish by comparison. You know, there's nothing like it. There's, you know, and I've studied hundreds of these groups there's nothing like it in all of history and people come away from it and it's like i don't like this comparison but i'm going to make it because it's simple it's like your software has been written you yeah. are now acting out the programs that are put there so even though you might cut out the language and no longer use the loaded language of scientology the concepts are buried deep and I've seen people who decades later were still caught up in this way of thinking. And it's a it's a hateful way of thinking. It's a way of thinking that has no compassion in it. It's a way of thinking that's sociopathic, that's narcissistic. It's entirely selfish and it's wrong. It's not good for humanity. And it messes up the people who believe it because being a sociopath, heck, you don't really make that many friends. You're a predator. And Scientology is making predators. And people don't even realize it's happened to them. So if somebody's come out of Scientology and they haven't found out what hypnotism is, even though Elrond Hubbard said you've got to know what it is if you're going to be a good auditor, then they're still caught. If they still think that psychology is you know, a taboo subject that you've got to be frightened of, uh, they're still caught in, in the trap. And so to get out of the trap, reading what you've written, looking at, at the, the many podcasts you've done, to understand the information, to to get what you were really involved in. It wasn't a, something that was going to liberate humanity and turn us all into gods. It was a terrible trap. It was a way of, it's a form of psychic vampirism. It's a way of, you know, sucking out the, the souls from people and enslaving people psychologically and physically. And right now we have somewhere over 4,000 slaves in Scientology, members of the C organization. And let me just put a plug. I've recently joined the Aftermath Foundation, which has as its sole objective to help people to escape from their slavery in Scientology. And the you know, main part of that is knowing what the truth is, knowing what really happened as opposed to thinking you were part of something wonderful and glamorous and magical. That's right. Yeah. I, I, I could not, uh, put it better. That was great. That was, that Thank was perfect. You. Cause that's exactly right. Um, and having lived 10 years now out of it, hmm. it's taken all this conversation and catharsis for me to be able to say I've overcome all that crap or at hmm. least certainly the, the, the big chunks of it. Yeah. 10 years of this and that's therapy that's writing that's reading that is uh, discussions that is podcasts that is videos all of that in the direction of trying to get myself out of that headspace drop all those habits that literally were ingrained in me since I was a child and you think you're just going to walk away from that or something like that and you're going to be fine and it's not my reality it's not how I've that's not how my life has gone and and I've helped and John has helped so many people over the years get past this stuff. Mm. And it doesn't have to take forever. I'm not saying you have to take 10 years to do it. That's me. I'm second mm. gen. I grew up with this crap. Mm. So, so it, it tends to be a bit more multi-layered for us, you know, uh, survivors who were kids in it. Yes. Of course. It um, that's, that's just a reality. That's not mm. me trying to play trauma Olympics. I, I, I feel for people who were first generation members and have to overcome their, their problems and issues with this too. It's not, it's not a competition, but it's just a recognition of the deep, deep layers of this. 
and they do go all the way down. So even when you come out of Scientology and you hate L. Ron Hubbard and you hate the ethics and you hate Scientology and you think the Sea Org sucks and you're not going to be Thetans anymore and you're not going to think that way anymore. Great. Good job. That's step one. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's it just, goes just... a little deeper than that. And and it's important. I mean, um, I have a friend who, who was talking to some of the uh, Nixium victims mm. and and yeah. he said to them you know it'll take you a long time to get over this and i kind of pulled him up and said you really shouldn't be telling people that people will work at their own speed and to their own depth yeah. and yeah i've had situations where somebody has come i, I had a, a an email this year from from a woman who said um, i'd talked with her in i think it was 1994 and for an hour and it completely changed her life you know and i'm just the catalyst for that i didn't do anything other than allow her to be sure of what what she'd perceived which was that she was actually involved in a subcult of scientology um an ex one of the hundreds of subcults the independent cults that have grown up since 1950 right. and it allowed her to look at it and change her life so for some people it can be a very quick thing. This isn't like auditing. You don't have to have right. in a right. few months' time, you'll be clear. You don't That's have to right. spend decades doing this to get absolutely nowhere at all. Right. And often it's just a, a simple realization. And the main realization is Elron Hubbard wasn't truthful. Elron Hubbard wasn't right. So right. being able to challenge what he said and realize that it isn't true, it isn't a way to live your life. He was a bad person. He, he was a destructive, predatory person who was completely screwed up. He had no decent relationships. He had no friends. His relationship with his children, oh, come on. You know, oh. what a terrible, terrible human being. Oh. When Quentin oh, kills himself, Hubbard's saying, oh, that's more bad publicity he's caused for us. That's right. how much reality he had in terms of, 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 you know, being a human being. He was a... He was a a vicious beast of a human being. And the problem is that his philosophy points in that direction. And if you still have this stuff in you, there is there is this strong chance that, that you are harming the people around you. That's right. Um, and That's right. and let, let me say on a personal note, we've known each other for nine years now, and I have seen your transformation. You know, I have been privy to your transformation. That, that, that as a person, you have become a better person. There's no doubt about that. And you are quite a nice person to start with, frankly. But, <laughs> you know, you've you've worked seriously to understand this problem and to help others understand it. And, you know, that's the greatest virtue we can have to enhance our understanding and, and share with others and help them to understand and become Oh, here's that Scientology idea. Become self-determined rather than being <laughs> run determined. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Ah, oh, John. Great stuff. Thank you. And thank you very much uh, for those kind mm. words. I, of course. I have definitely felt the change over the years. It's been awesome. And mm. um and, and, and you're a happier person now than you were then. Oh, so much. Yeah. So and much me, so. and me too, even in this last nine years. You know, it's uh it's we have Prod the road to happiness. What can I say? <laughs> yeah, here's the here's the way to happiness. Get out of Scientology. It's the road <laughs> out of there. That's as fast your way as you to can. happiness. Oh. Exactly. Great. All right, okay. Chuck, thanks for yep. uh, thanks for doing this with me. Mm. A great pleasure as always, Chris. Absolutely, and I look forward to doing it again. Uh, folks out there, subscribe to John's channel. As I have always said, and as John uh, so uh, wonderfully said here today in describing this book on the cult of greed, check out the cult of greed, but check out Let's Sell These People a Piece of Blue Sky. If I have I have completely selfishly said, of course, you need to buy my book, right? My book analyzes Scientology and it breaks it down and it's wonderful. But if you really want to get Scientology, you got to do both books. You got to yep. get John's book because it gives you background and information on Hubbard and what it's up to and how it works in ways that I did not address in my book. And, and when, when you do them both, you're really going to get the whole picture, right? Everything else after that is 
is testimonials and memoirs and stories that are absolutely clarifying and interesting and tell you various aspects of the experience of Scientology, like the Going Clear documentary. You saw a lot of people's stories there. But if you want a breakdown of what it is, that's what we do. And, uh, yeah. and I hope you guys will check that out. And if you want to overcome it or help others overcome it, you need to know what it is. It, it's, it is absolutely, there are some incredible, you know, there are now, I think, more than 100 autobiographies have been yeah. published. And um, they're, they're very poignant and very meaningful. Helen O'Brien's Dianetics in Limbo, I think, is mm. the most poignant. And yep. I don't think it's ever actually been published. She sent me a copy of it. Um, I, have, I have a bootleg. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, it should be out there. But mm -hmm. so so much has been written by journalists, so much has been written by people, you know, um Janice Gillum Grady's books showing and, and she's so forthright about it. She yeah. was a slave. She was a child slave. Right. And you know, has come away not believing any of it. Um, bless her. But these are all very, very worthy, but you have to 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 liberate yourself from it. You have to look at what it is. I we've both been very careful. As I say, there are more than eleven hundred reference notes in Blue Sky, and the principal source for Blue Sky there are one hundred and fifty people that you know at their writings or people I interviewed or testimony they gave. One hundred and fifty people to give you some sense of that. Religion Inc., a book by Stuart Lamont, published about Scientology. He talked with five people um, inside Scientology. Janet Reitman refers to to my book to russell's book says the first seven chapters are largely based upon them and then talks to less than a dozen people so 150 yep. people but the main witness to my book and to yours is ron hubbard himself and you can check this this is factual material this is not something we dreamed up it, that right. it's referenced and, and you can go and check it exactly and please do Please do. And please do. Yeah. Yeah. You will find it. You really will. You'll, you'll find it incredibly enlightening stuff. Very, very interesting. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and not, and not just for the Scientology. There's a ton of Scientology stuff in there, but you know, as we are, as we love to do on this show and, and on John's channel is relating these things to the other groups out there, the other mm -hmm. activities out there, even domestic partnerships out there. Absolutely. All this stuff is related, you know? Mm -hmm. So when you're learning about one, you're actually learning about all. And that's what I find so fascinating about this stuff, to be honest with you. The day that that kind of dropped in my head that they're all the same patterns, mm -hmm. it was like a revelation. You know, yeah, that, it, uh, it was different. Our friend Christian Sherko, um, he in who's counseled more people than I've had hot dinners. It's, it's in the thousands of people now. He's been 50 yeah. years doing this incredible man. Yeah. Incredible man. But he, for some time, used uh, Scientology, The Cult of Greed, as his primary book, not for people coming out of Scientology, but for everybody else. Yeah. And then I published Opening Our Minds, and he switched to that. <laughs> nice. Because which uses Scientology very much as, as you know, to show authoritarian and abusive behavior. And the reason he gave for this, he said, well, Scientology does everything. All of the things you can do to mess with a person, Scientology does. And so coming from any other group, you will recognize some aspect of these techniques. And then with opening our minds, I sought to apply it just to the psychology of, of abuse. And right. um, Elrond Hubbard scores pretty high in, in, in those terms. Anyway, fantastic. And um, thanks so much. And, and we'll, we'll talk again in a month or two. Yes. And um, have some more fun. That's right. Yep. <laughs> okay, folks, subscribe to John's channel. Subscribe to my channel. Like our videos. Share them around. Mm. That's how you can help us. That and would be course, very helpful. Yeah. yeah, go on social media and make a noise about us. You know, right. grab little clips from what we've done and put them up on yeah. Meta and X and other renamed things. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> All the platforms. <laughs> All the platforms. Right, folks, see you next yeah. week. Yeah. Bye-bye.